Today we're going to be looking at another one of Nile Red's videos, specifically making purple gold. Man, that looks like it's radioactive or something. And well, actually, gold is a little bit radioactive. No, that's not the reason why it's purple. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into this. This video has been sponsored by Opera. Back in 2019, I was sent some old jewelry from a viewer, and I was able to turn it into these pure 24 karat gold bars, which I thought were pretty nice. I remember Since that video. Since then, though, I've been really interested in gold in general, and a couple years ago, I stumbled onto a form of it that I'd somehow never heard of before. It was something called Purple Gold, and this website was selling it as jewelry, and in my opinion, it was one of the nicest forms of gold that I had ever seen. However, the color of it also kind of seemed unnatural, and at first, I honestly thought that it was probably a scam. With very <laughs> Can't little say research, I blame though, you on that one. I quickly found out that purple gold was actually real. Just a compound. And according to Wikipedia, it was an alloy of gold and aluminum. Now, I'm not someone who's normally into jewelry, so not pure but gold. for some reason, the moment that I saw that it was real, I really wanted to buy some. Now, what's interesting is it is technically possible to make gold in a nuclear reactor. Though it's pretty rare, because it's technically possible when you fission a uranium-235, your fission products are not always the same. You'll see the probabilities are mainly centered around atomic masses of 100-ish to about 130, approximately. Which is why you see things like xenon-135 or cesium-137 show up quite a bit, or strontium-90. And gold, well, it's at 197, which you don't even see on this chart, which doesn't mean it's impossible, so you can, you can get it. It'd be a very lopsided fission collision, if you will, with the neutron hitting your uranium or plutonium nucleus. But it is technically possible, but I can't say I recommend using nuclear reactors for large-scale alchemy. Never thought I'd have to say that. More specifically, though, I really wanted a ring that was made entirely out of purple gold. However, like long story short, on. that website didn't sell one. It's fascinating. And as far as I could tell, there wasn't a single company or person in the world who sold a pure purple gold ring. Maybe I'm a bit more traditional, but hey. <laughs> purple could be fun. At first, I thought this was kind of odd, but apparently this was just because purple gold was a huge pain <laughs> to make and to work with in general. It also turned out that Li Hua, the owner of that website, to see why this video was is so one of long. the only companies that even made purple gold jewelry. With all that being said, though, I still really wanted a pure purple gold ring. And now, knowing that it was actually impossible to buy, I kind of wanted it even more. At the same time, I also felt that it had to be possible to make an entire ring out of it. And I started thinking, that this was something that I might just be able to make myself. I mean, I had absolutely zero experience with purple gold, and I had when never has made ever a ring out of anything before. before. But for some reason, I really felt that I could do it, and I decided to just go for it. That That is an awesome attitude. Um, I kind of wish I had that sort of <laughs> mindset. But anyway, to get started, the first thing that I had to do was figure out how to even make the purple gold. <laughs> I and don't know, please give search, me information. <laughs> I was able to find a lot of videos and articles talking about it. However, none of them gave any real information see pop this in a on chat how GPT. to make anything remotely decent. With a bit more searching, though, I was eventually like. able to find this patent, which turned out to be extremely useful. Interesting. This is because it not only gave a lot of good info about purple gold in general, it also explained how to potentially fix one of the biggest problems with it, which was how fragile it was. Mm. It said that normally... Now that's so weird for it to be that, I guess it's just the alloy with the aluminum can causes that thing, because gold is known for being super, super malleable. You could even make radiation shielding out of gold. It's expensive, though it is... It's one of the densest. It's 70% denser than lead, so it'd be a great gamma shield. The typical mixture of about 78.5% gold and 21.5% okay. aluminum, it was as brittle as glass or porcelain, Ooh. 
and that it was way too fragile to make any jewelry with it. However, it claimed that by altering jewelry. its composition just slightly, or by adding some other metals to it, like palladium or nickel, okay. it was possible to make purple gold that was significantly stronger. It also provided a bunch of example recipes, and the one that caught my eye was this one, which appeared to be the simplest. It didn't require any other metals besides gold and aluminum, and the only difference was that the gold content was slightly increased to 81%, which would make it about 19 karat gold, and this was what I decided to go with. The only tricky part was that besides the ingredients, mm. it really didn't tell me anything else, and there was pretty much no information on how to actually make the purple gold. This is beginning to become a running trope for for a now red video. It's like, yeah, this thing is sort of possible to do, but we don't really have a documented process to follow. So we're just going to kind of wing it and figure out how to do stuff like that. It even it actually kind of reminds me of things like the Manhattan Project because they've never synthesized a nuclear weapon, nuclear device before. Uranium 235 was this exotic super element because all that they had was just natural uranium in fact to make the uh, little boy device they used well over 90 percent of all the uranium 235 in the world just because there's so little of it back in 1945. so unfortunately this meant that i was going to have to figure out everything myself and considering that it was supposed to be really hard to work with, <laughs> it will I was honestly the kind of worried. You cannot pour an ingot or cast this alloy. Though, that no, I, I really want to see a purple ingot. That would be so cool. Like a purple section of Fort Knox. At the last second, I found out that all of the purple gold that's sold by Li Hua is actually based on this patent. So even though it didn't give any real instructions, I at least knew that the recipe itself should have been trustworthy and I decided to just go for it. With that being said, I could now actually get started and the first and most important thing that I needed was some gold. <laughs> I like that it's in gold font. unfortunately fun. isn't exactly cheap. So I initially planned on buying as you little do the as same possible, thing he did for that other video. And I figured that something like 20 grams would probably be more than enough. Get some junk At the gold. last minute, though, I convinced myself that it was a good idea to get a bit more, just in case I needed it, and long story short, I ended up with this 100 gram bar. In total, this cost me about $5,700 US, Dude. or about $7,800 Canadian, and this immediately put me over the budget that I originally had for this project. <laughs> the best part is this gold bar came in one of these pain and to open little container things that I like that he just t immediately takes a box cutter and goes right to it because those things are uh, have always been more trouble than they're worth. And but yeah, it's it's gold, and I've never seen anything gold or really anything that expensive in one of those specific types of containers. And it was probably way more than I needed, but oh well. Either way, I now had this beautiful and shiny bar of gold. That almost looks fake. And just looking at it and holding it in my hand was oddly satisfying. Nine. The only sad part was... I've seen in some places the comma refer to as a decimal point, though not on anything I've ever worked with in, in the nuclear plant or any professional engineering type documentation or reference. I actually think it's a bit confusing because I'm used to seeing comma as in in between to count every three digits over like a comma after 1000, for instance. And seeing a comma with only one digit after it to me is a little confusing. That it was kind of useless to me as one big bar. And unfortunately, the first thing that I had to do with it was destroy it. No, but it's more specifically, so I was going to have to break That's it apart dusty. into a bunch of smaller pieces because I had to be able to measure out very specific and accurate amounts of it. To do this, the most obvious way would have been to tear it apart manually using something like a chisel and a hammer, but that would have been an insane amount of work with most likely yeah. mediocre results. Instead, I felt that it was a much better idea to do it chemically, there you so go. I just carefully placed it in a beaker and I poured in a bunch of concentrated hydrochloric That's acid. That's big for gold, well, it's expensive. I then turned on the heating, and over the next few minutes, it slowly warmed up, and it eventually started boiling. Then, when I felt that I was ready, I shot in some concentrated nitric acid. 
almost immediately, there was a lot more bubbling, Here we go. and the solution it's started changing yellow. color. This is because the nitric acid was reacting with the hydrochloric acid, and it was forming nitrosyl chloride and chlorine gas, both of which are yellow. Yeah, better have your fume More hood importantly, ready. though, unlike the hydrochloric chlorine acid gas. alone, this new acid mixture, commonly known as aqua regia, was able to attack the gold bar. It wasn't super fast, but it was slowly shredding it apart, and it was turning it into something called chlorooric acid, which was then getting dissolved away. <laughs> this is a fun thing. I've never heard of, like, yeah, chlorooric. That's a fun word to say, but that's awesome. So, what I was doing here was... It's just fascinating how you can just separate stuff out like that, down to the micro and nano level. Speaking of which... Gold can actually be used at, for medical imaging in, in certain diagnostic procedures, like, like CT scans, for instance. Because it, And it enhances the contrast on X-ray images in, in the CT scans because gold has a high absorption cross-section. When I say cross-section, I mean it has a high probability of absorbing X-rays. So when it's inserted into the body on again a nanoparticle form don't recommend inserting this acid or just having someone swallow a gold bar that would be expensive then again everything is expensive that's healthcare related at least in the u.s but anyway it'll help things be easier to spot in cer certain tissues just because of that added contrast that gold that gold would provide to your x-ray images. They can also even be targeted to accumulate in in tumors, which would help you just find where the cancer is and where it's and where it's spreading. So gold can be a medical device, which is fascinating. Basically breaking it apart at the atomic level, which was way better than I could ever do manually. <laughs> and on top of that it... uh, manually there's a bunch of industry jokes that people who have been in the nuclear industry for a long time, that back in their day, they split atoms with really, really small hammers. That'd be kind of hard to do. It was just a lot easier. All I had to do was occasionally add small amounts of nitric acid, now and it's over the next orange. few hours, it now very red. slowly disappeared. Eventually, all that was left was just a thin sheet of gold, Whoa. and with just a little bit more acid, I was able to completely get rid of it. Now we got There's some now expensive gold no drink. no trace of the original bar, and all 100 grams of the gold was dissolved as the chlorooric acid. What's interesting is gold in, like, the nanoparticle form that you see for diagnostic aids is actually red. So it's not surprising to me to see this turn red when he's talking about stripping the atoms, attacking it on an atomic level. So, hey, it checks out. I then let it cool down to room temperature, and what I had to do next was turn all of this chlorooric acid back into metallic gold. At first, it might not make much sense why I just Run the reaction it all, backwards, only to mm. immediately bring it back, but it'll all make sense in a few minutes. <laughs> With that being said, I then just grabbed the beaker and started walking over to my other fume hood. Oh boy. <laughs> That's expensive. Mmm. I feel bad. No. Oh no. <laughs> okay, that was actually just a beaker full of water and food coloring, and what I really did was pour ah, it all into a bunch of extra water. You tricked us! I also washed the beaker a few times with some more water to make sure that there was absolutely no gold left behind. Then after that, I screwed it around to make sure that it was all fully mixed, and when I felt that I was ready, like the use I dumped of the red in a spoon. concentrated solution of potassium metabisulfite. This caused the there entire thing to quickly turn brown and to heat up a lot, and I was it's really black, happy to see this. Camera it does. I might this is because it meant that the potassium metabisulfite was working, and that it was reducing all of the gold in the chlorooric acid Chlor back to its metallic form. I'm not going to get tired of that. The very important part, though, was that it wasn't all just coming back as a large chunk or something, and it was instead crashing out as a super fine powder. So, by there just dissolving go. the bar and bringing it back, I had effectively pulverized it to a dust, and again, this was way better and easier than anything I ever could have done manually.
And that makes perfect sense that it's going to come back as a powder because, again, he took it apart at a really small, again, at the atomic level using that, that chemical reaction. So it's not going to come back as one big chunk. I mean, I guess it's technically possible, but the probability of that happening is so insignificantly low that might as well just say it's impossible. <laughs> it's easier to explain. But it's a bit like when you shatter that beaker and you put it back together again, you could probably make a little mosaic of, you know, gluing all that beaker stuff back together, like on the ground, but it's going to be really hard to actually make it back into a, into a beaker. Over the next 30 minutes, pretty much all of it sank to the bottom, but there was still a small amount of it floating around. So I decided to leave it overnight, and when I came back to it the next day, it was completely clear. Mm. I was now able to get rid of all the water, and I just quickly poured it out into another container. I was also very careful to not lose any of the it's gold, like dirt. and when it eventually Powdered looked like there was dirt. almost no water left, I transferred it all to a small beaker. I then poured in some boiling distilled water. Now it looks like the gold dirt that you see the old timey prospectors have when they're when they're panning for gold in the little streams in the old west. It's like we're seeing all the different faces of regular gold before we get to purple gold. I like this process. And I turned on the hot plate and I let it sit there for several minutes. I was doing this to get rid of any residual potassium metabisulfite and other side products. And after that, I did it a few times with hot hydrochloric acid. This would help get rid of any trace impurities of other metals that might be there. And there when I go. felt that it looked good, I washed it a few more times with hot water. What I had now should have been some super nice and clean gold, and all I had to do next was dry it. So I cranked up the heating on the hot plate, and I waited for all the water to disappear. This ended up taking go. over an hour, which was way longer than I expected. But when it was eventually done, things always seem to take longer I had than some you nice and crispy like powdered gold. When I weighed it, it was also 99.99 grams, and this meant that I had only so lost, lost 0 0.01 grams. grams in this entire process. Now it looks like the little rub you put on your uh, chicken before you fry it. <laughs> However, considering that the original bar was only 99.99% pure, it was very that possible again. that this small amount was actually just some impurity and that what I had now was more pure than it was before. But anyway, at this point, all of the gold was ready to go. And the only you test other thing that, that I needed was some aluminum, if you want to. <laughs> and I bought this bag of it from eBay. It was supposed to be 99.995% pure, and it was the absolute highest purity that I was able to find. It also came as a bunch of small bag. pellets, which I felt would make it easy to measure out. And now, it was finally time to try and make some purple gold. Almost looks like aluminum... Looks kind of like the aluminum cladding you see for nuclear fuel pellets, though the, these are these are going to be even smaller than than those, but not not a whole lot bigger. It's it's crazy though how a little pistachio sized item contains more energy than a ton of coal. So I carefully measured out four point nine five grams of the gold, which was really easy to do in its powder form, and I added it to a small crucible. Normally, I also would have added something called borax, which would both help the gold melt and prevent it from sticking to the dish, but I unfortunately couldn't do that here. Technically, borax could actually be used to shut down a reactor since boron has a higher chance of absorbing neutrons than uranium or plutonium, for that matter. So sprinkle a little, little household cleaner into the reactor that could shut it down, assuming it could survive the hellish uh, high pressures and temperatures. but. Boric acid is actually used to control reactor power by that same logic. Think of it as liquid control rods, but I guess you could have powdered control rods. Because it would react with the aluminum. Either mm. way, I then just started blasting it with a blowtorch. That's another reason why aluminum could be used as cladding, but it's less resistant, and it has been in the past. But it's less resilient than zirconium alloys. Aluminum is just more reactive. Whereas zircaloy, you need extremely high temperatures, even higher than temperature than operating temperatures in a nuclear power plant. 
for it to cause reactions. And very quickly, the top of it turned red hot. That's And cool. I could slowly see some of it starting to melt. As I kept heating it, it was also slowly shrinking. And about 30 seconds later, I was left with two separate slobs, which eventually combined to form a nice little bead. <laughs> I then kept blasting it just to get it as hot as possible. And when it was red hot, I dumped in exactly 1.61 grams of the aluminum metal. Technically, this is a form of fusion, just uh, melting and combining. It's a form of fusion. So when people talk about, hey, finally achieving fusion, or I see this mainly in a lot of works of uh, fiction, like even in Star Wars, referring to fusion as a power source, but it involves super heavy elements. Well, they can't possibly be talking about nuclear fusion, but it could involve melting or some combination of things in order to make whatever crazy um, shielding or armor technology they have. Just something that gets thrown up a lot. The ones that were touching the gold almost immediately melted and combined with it, but it looked like the others needed a bit more convincing. <laughs> However, even after making them They're red further hot, away from your they heat still source. weren't melting, and this was because the thin oxide layer that naturally forms around aluminum was holding in the liquid metal. Mm. So to actually get it to mix, I was going to have to poke at it a bit, and I was happy to see that it all easily combined together. What's interesting is when people say, you know, uranium, so talking about oxides, when people talk about uranium fuel pellets, it's actually a uranium oxide. That's actually where this black stuff comes from on these uranium fuel pellets that you see when you'd actually, if you were to actually cut open a uh, nuclear fuel assembly. Can't say I recommend doing that to spent fuel because you're going to release fission products. That's the reason why it's protected in, a, in the super durable uh, zircaloy cladding compared to regular uranium, which just looks like any other ordinary, boring, shiny metal. It is toxic though. Radiation is not really the biggest hazard. It's just the same toxicity that you'd see in things like lead. So please don't huff it. What I was more happy to see, though, was that below all of the crusty that little shiny the stuff top, in there, it looked like there was a nice and free flowing liquid. It's so gooey. I was also kind of surprised to see this because there were at least a few comments that I read online, which said that doing this in the presence of air would turn the entire thing into a horrible oxidized mess. OK, however, it wasn't nearly as reactive as I initially thought, and it definitely seemed like it could be possible to pour Maybe this it's because it's such a high purity. With that being said, those other people might have ran into issues with the impurities causing the thing to become more brittle. Because gold by itself is super malleable. It's just the impurities. And I guess when we get to the purple gold, maybe it's kind of like the combination of the impurities mixed with the gold and the aluminum that made it even more brittle than purple, what purple gold is allegedly going to be. Ed. I now theoretically had a mixture of 81% gold and 19% aluminum, okay. except it wasn't even remotely purple, and this was because it was still way too hot. It was also still a liquid. Yeah, you don't see purple to in too to many things purple, that are hot. I was going to have to let it cool down. As this happened, it was supposed to slowly crystallize as an alloy, where most of it had the Look chemical formula AUAL2, which is the form that has a really nice purple <laughs> color. According to the patent, though, by skewing the gold content slightly higher than the typical 78.5%, it would push a bunch of it towards a gamma phase gold aluminum structure. Just to be clear, we're talking strictly about crystalline structures and lattices in materials here. Gamma phase, nothing to do with gamma radiation. Now that isn't to say something that's a gamma source can also be gamma phase, it's just talking about something different. So things like this, whether it's a face-centered cube or a body-centered cube. I honestly still don't entirely know what that means, <laughs> and I've had a very hard time finding any good info about it, but the important part yeah, golden was that it was supposed to make the alloy a lot stronger. When it did eventually get so mainly when I think of gamma phase, I'm thinking of like the iron carbon structure in steel and usually gamma. So I'm not, I can't say I'm an expert on material science, but my understanding of it is gamma is off. Those structures come from things that are kind of 
that are high temperature. So you'll see, you will see things like that in, in piping applications in power plants. And with the added density, yeah, I guess a gamma phase, on average, a gamma phase might be better at shielding from gamma radiation. But don't don't take that comment too seriously <laughs> to room temperature though it sadly still wasn't purple mm. because it was covered in a bunch of blue oxidized junk if there were actually any purple gold it was all hidden inside mm. and to see if it were there i was first gonna have to get it out of the crucible so i just carefully poked at it with a metal spatula <laughs> and even without any borax it was surprisingly easy to remove. There what go. I had Pokey now was a, was a super crusty and ugly piece of metal. And to see if I had actually made any purple gold, all I had to do was break it open. I also figured that this would be pretty easy considering how weak and brittle even this stronger stuff was supposed to be. So I just tried snapping it in half. However, okay. it turned out to be a lot tougher than I expected. And it really didn't feel like I was even close to breaking it. So instead, I decided to just quickly kill it with a hammer, and I kind of assumed that it would easily shatter. But again, nah, that apparently just a bit wasn't of the case. Slough coming off it. I mean, I didn't exactly hit it super hard, but still, it definitely didn't seem like it was as brittle as glass or porcelain. No. And all of that gamma phase stuff appeared to be working. <laughs> but anyway, I then just kept hitting it, each time doing it a bit harder. And when it did eventually break, hey, I was purple. really happy with what I saw. Inside of it was a bunch of beautiful purple gold, and the color of it almost seemed unnatural. What I thought was That's kind so of odd, cool. though, was that it wasn't quite the purple that I was expecting, and it seemed like it was a lot pinker than the jewelry I'd mm. seen online. This made me think that... That could just be as simple as... Some jewelry in particular a lot of times just looks different when you take a picture of it versus when you see it in person. It even looks a little bit more purple to me just looking at his video because he did it in a camera. It's, it's fascinating how little difference is like that, which is technically a difference in how different radiation detectors work because these are all visible light radiation detectors, eyeballs and cameras. Maybe I'd chosen a bad recipe or something, but when I checked the patent, it actually said that it was supposed to be a pinkish okay. purple. It also said the same thing for all of the other recipes. And again, considering that this was the patent that the Liwa stuff was based on, I trusted that it was probably good. I also started thinking that maybe the darker color only came out later on in the process or when it was being polished or something. And I decided to just keep going. Hmm. So now, assuming that this recipe was good, what I had to do next it was looks somehow like it describes figure out it how to go from just good. making a bunch of crusty crap <laughs> to a nice and shiny <laughs> ring. This was going to be a lot of work, though, and just thinking about all of the different things that yeah. I was going to have to test kind of overwhelmed me. And this made me feel that the only way to move forward was to just take the process step by step. That's how you break down anything complicated, but... This is a huge undertaking, and it, it's crazy that he's doing so good at something like this with things that he's never done before, things that aren't very well documented, and he explains it in such a compelling way that I don't know if some people are watching this and just following along with their own step-by-step. -step. <laughs> this way, I wouldn't break my brain, and I would only have to focus on one major problem at a time. Don't your brain's and looking right like that. now... I felt that the biggest issue was the oxides. This is because they were clearly <laughs> making everything a huge mess, and if I even wanted a remote chance of making anything nice, I was definitely going to have to get rid of them. Mm. To do this, there was also only one real way, and I was going to have to somehow stop the aluminum from reacting with oxygen in the air. So I went online looking for some ideas, and after searching for a long time, I was only able to find two decent suggestions. That's I like the way he Google searches. <laughs> the first was to buy a super expensive and specialized inert atmosphere wow. casting machine. And the second one was to basically custom build something that was equivalent. <laughs> what even is this thing? All right, I mean, he, okay, yeah, it says he stuck it into an AI, but that is awesome. However, I really didn't feel like it had to be that complicated or expensive, 
And after thinking about it for a while, I came up with an idea that I thought was relatively simple. I figured that all I had to do was use this small tabletop furnace that I already owned and to load in one of my smallest crucibles. Then after that, I just lowered in some stainless steel tubing that I'd gotten for free and I'd quickly bent it to fit around the furnace. What was important though was that at the other end of this tubing, it was connected to a tank filled with inert argon gas that I'd gotten from a local welding shop, and that was basically it. What I had now was just a regular furnace with the ability to shoot some argon into it, and I really felt that it was going to work. There was only one way to find out though, so I quickly added the gold, started a, a steady powdery. flow of argon, and I set the furnace to 2200 Fahrenheit, which is about 1100 Celsius. Yep. Over the next 15 yes. minutes, it then slowly heated up and the gold powder slowly shrank, except it was looking That's like it was having cool some looking. trouble melting with the top open, so I covered it with some KO wool. After that, it only took a few minutes to have a nice little blob of gold at the bottom, and now I could add the aluminum. This time, though, I decided to use some much larger pieces Whoa, of it, okay. which weren't quite as pure, but I was hoping that they would liquefy a lot more easily it's than the smaller pellets. ones. To load it in, I just carefully dropped in the first piece, and I was very happy to see there it that goes. it all quickly combined with the gold. This I then added the rest of the aluminum, which also quickly got... Yeah, melting point of aluminum is about half that temperature, so not surprised it did not last very long. ...got sucked up, and at this point, it was already looking way better than the first attempt. What I was especially excited... That's another reason, by the way, why you don't... ...moved away from using aluminum as, as a cladding. At least by itself, because... Yeah, it, it just doesn't... ...doesn't resist high temperatures very well. ...it about was that it looked like there were barely any oxides, and this meant that the argon was doing a decent job. This was also really impressive go. considering that the aluminum was red hot and that it was way more reactive than normal liquid aluminum. But anyway, what I had now was some nice and relatively oxide free purple gold and what I had to do next was try and pour it. In theory, it probably would have been a good idea to protect it from air while I did that as well. Sure. And I did consider putting together some sort of specialized setup. However, instead, I decided to go with the very sophisticated method there it comes. of just going as fast as possible. Yeah, there so you go. So <laughs> I just quickly got rid of the argon line. Go fast so the oxygen doesn't have time to do its reaction. That's, that is an approach to do things as fast as possible. At least within the nuclear industry, that's not one that's very highly regarded. It's definitely the go slow to go fast mindset that shows up. But let's see what happens. Pulled the crucible out of the furnace and tried pouring it out onto a preheated graphite mold. I like As I did these this, I was really hoping to see a nice stream of red hot metal, but nothing was coming out. That's what I was expecting And it too. didn't even work when I tilted it completely upside down. It stuck to the bottom? <laughs> At first, I was kind of confused, but then I realized that all of the purple gold had just frozen in the crucible. Apparently, oh, just a, a solid. few seconds was enough for it to cool wow. down below its melting point, and I was clearly going to have to get it as hot as possible. So I just put it back in the furnace, dropped in the argon line, and covered the top, and I left it there Frank it up. until the entire thing was bright red. I then again attempted to go as fast as possible, and it was still a bit stubborn, but I was actually able goes. to pour it out. Just one slow. Oh, look the how only fast sad that part goes. was that it was a complete piece of trash, and having to remelt it, had apparently caused it to get really oxidized. Mm. This told me that I only had one real chance to pour it out, which wasn't ideal, but at least That's now... That's never ideal. I knew exactly what to do. So, I quickly whipped up a new batch of the purple gold. <laughs> Looks like a marshmallow. <laughs> and this time, when I poured it out, I was really happy with what I saw. Okay. I then let it cool down to room temperature, and when I took a closer look at it, it was definitely the best result that I had so far. It seems like a lot of these issues are just uh, him learning just proper metal casting techniques. Now, I'm not an expert on metal casting. You mentioned speed being a component. I mean, certain ways you tilt or pour the device. I mean, I know he's doing all the right things with using the argon to prevent oxidation, as well as his use of borax, but 
there's probably a lot of intuitive knowledge there that you can read a procedure or a process on metal casting just like you can for starting up a reactor and there's just a few things that come up that you'll just learn with experience over time and it's really exciting to see someone who has a lot of i would say broad knowledge around chemistry and these sort of processes but then he branches out into some of these like highly specified skills it's really cool to see someone do that and again not afraid to uh, show some of their missteps on on camera that's one of the many things i love about watching the all reds video i mean it still wasn't perfect but it looked way cleaner and it's it wasn't good to me. anything like the crusty mess that i had before the only thing that I thought was odd was that it was silver, and I had assumed that without a lot of the oxides, that it would have been significantly more purple. At the same time, though, Purpleness I figured center. that maybe it was just a bit of aluminum or something that was mm -hmm. on the surface, and that it would be really easy to get rid of. <laughs> kind of reminds me of those little chocolates that you crack that are like brown on the outside, and you have like the weird uh, gooey stuff in the middle. Never been a big fan of those, but yeah, silver on the outside, maybe purple on the inside. <laughs> So, I decided to try sanding it a bit, and I was assuming that when I flipped it over, Put I would it on see that really to make nice purple. pinkish purple color, except it was still just silver. I then tried sanding it even more, thinking that maybe I just hadn't taken enough away, but it didn't seem to make ah, a difference. Maybe it's not purple on the inside. When I saw this, I was honestly kind of confused, and the only explanation that I could think of was that I had somehow failed to make the purple gold. So to check this, I was going to have to break it open, hmm. and this time, I was even more surprised by how strong it was. I was hitting it way harder than before, wow. and it didn't seem to do anything, and eventually, it ended up making a huge dent in my wooden table. <laughs> After hitting it seven times, though, nail. I was finally able to crack a small piece off of it, and I was kind of upset by what I saw. This is because inside of it, it was definitely colored, Muted and it made no sense why sanding it wasn't working. What I thought was even more upsetting, though, was that it was only They're barely so small. pink, yeah. and it wasn't nearly as vibrant as mm. the first attempt. This also really hmm. didn't make any sense to me, because I'd basically done the exact same thing as before, except without any air present, and it really shouldn't have had any effect on the color. I'm not sure. However, I was going to have to be absolutely sure that this wasn't an issue with the new setup or with the different aluminum. And to test this, I just quickly did the exact same thing and I made a fresh piece of it and I waited for it to cool down. Okay. I then got my hammer and this time I protected my table with a steel plate. And after one good hit, I was really happy with what I saw. Okay. It was actually purple, which told me that my setup and my aluminum were probably fine, and I still have no idea what went wrong with the f Just an anomalous piece you happen to use. That's fascinating. I mean, statistical anomaly, perhaps? Just like, just like I kind of mentioned in the, in the previous video, there's a chance if you fission uranium-235, you'll get a piece of gold very low. Should never re realistically happen, but I guess this is also appears to be a larger piece. So when you have a larger, more of the material, you're less likely to have these sort of weird things to happen. But I don't know. Maybe maybe someone in the comments does. Either way, I then took one of these pieces and I assumed that with the much stronger color, it would actually sand properly. But that apparently wasn't the case. Like before, no matter how much I sanded it, it never turned purple. You should sand some of the pieces off, because if, if, if he's sanding off some of the purple bits, it might get lost in the purple sandpaper. And I just couldn't understand why. What was even worse, though, was that after this, I tried just sanding the purple part itself, mostly okay. out of desperation, and I was devastated when I saw that it turned silver. There's not that much purple. I had no idea purple. how this was even possible, but it was a horrible thing to see, because if sanding it or grinding it wasn't an option, it would be extremely hard to make anything nice out of it. Yeah. As a completely last ditch effort to fix this problem, I decided to drop this little piece of it into a beaker and to add some hydrochloric acid. To separate it. I thought that maybe just a very thin layer of aluminum was blocking the purple gold or something, and I was hoping that the acid would get rid of it. However, as the aluminum disappeared, it just slowly went back to being pure gold, which I actually thought was pretty interesting, but it didn't help me at all. Hmm. 
at this point, I was rid really of them, lost yeah. as to why this was happening, and I had almost no all idea how to fix yeah. it. And I ended up spending the next few days trying a bunch of other random stuff. That's cool, though. I guess you can use hydrochloric acid to go fully backwards and not only remove the aluminum and just remove the aluminum from the thing. Because that's about as close to before. I mean, it's kind of hard in processes to go completely reversible without, like, distorting it or whatever. Like, in the previous video, he ended up going from when he removed the gold and then ended up changing it back and ended up in kind of the gold, rocky, powdery stuff that you would see like some of the pioneers used when they were panning for gold back in the 1800s, but it's interesting to see he went back to this. I then spent another few days reading everything that I could find online, and after finding absolutely nothing useful, <laughs> I honestly kind of felt like giving up. Before doing that, though, I decided to look at the patent one last time, and this turned out to be a really good idea because I saw something that I'd somehow never noticed before. It was also almost just said in passing, but it was here where it was mentioning the purple color, and the key words were, at least on annealing, at 600 C. What's interesting is these sort of like procedural and process reviews, I mean, I know this is a patent, so this isn't exactly quite the same, but he's effectively using it as a procedure due to the absence of a procedure. These review processes have definitely different individuals look at it, and they're also separated somewhat by time for if, if you were to say act as a second re reviewer after someone else and that's mainly just because you you notice things differently after um what i always call it letting it get cold like after you read something or after you write something if you try to review it too soon from it you're probably not gonna see some you're probably not gonna see anything that different but if you were to let it get cold have someone else look at it or let a, let a day pass or something, you're going to notice things you haven't seen before. And that's why a lot of major procedures, including ones for like starting up and shutting down a nuclear power plant, go through this rigorous sort of process. You can absolutely accommodate everything. You'd also do it to incorporate lessons learned from earlier on or maybe some previous condition reports, things that happened with equipment, um, whether it be something breaking or just something behaving in a bit of an unusual usual way these things are captured so you'll be you'll be ready the next time that happens after of course you know fixing or you know making making the necessary upgrades to correct a process but you'll still there's a big uh, there's a whole section in these procedures that talks about uh, that's a historical record if you will of things that have gone wrong so you can reference it when you're doing your pre-job briefing this didn't directly address the problem that i was having but it implied that there was a way to enhance or recover the color. And I figured that this was my only enhance chance. Enhance or recover the so color. So I just quickly preheated an unused crucible to 600C. And for this attempt, I also made this fresh new piece. Ooh, shiny. And I had sanded down nice and flat. Just like all the other times, this made it completely silver. And it kind of just looked like a generic piece of metal. Just shiny aluminum. And I had a hard time believing that this could actually turn purple. There was only one way to find out though, so I dropped it into the crucible, and then based on absolutely nothing, I decided to leave it for about 30 minutes. <laughs> when I came back to it, I was honestly based feeling pretty hopeful, nothing. and I was really curious to see how it was doing. So to get a closer look at it, I just carefully pulled out the crucible, and I dumped it onto some insulation, and I was genuinely shocked Whoa. by what I saw. Almost like magic, it had actually somehow turned it looks, purple. It kind of looks like an opal. And the moment that I saw this, I was really relieved. Huh. This is because it was very obvious that the heat treatment had worked, and the project was thankfully no longer at a complete dead end. Changes color What I thought heat. was really interesting, though, was that as it continued cooling down, Ooh, okay. the color of it slowly changed, and it was gradually shifting more towards that pinkish purple. However, it didn't seem to get quite as pink as I saw with the first attempt, and when I took a closer look at it, it appeared to be a darker purple. Mm. I mean, it still definitely wasn't as purple as the stuff that I saw online, but this at least showed me that even with the same recipe, the color could actually be pretty different. This also made me think that just your individual by annealing piece of it, it for longer, or just in a different way, it might have been possible to make it even more purple. With all that being said, though, right now, what I had was still kind of a piece of crap, and I felt that the most important thing to do next 
Just learning. Just to see if it was even possible to make something nice. More specifically, I had to see if I could actually mold, mold it, it into a specific shape and then clean it up. And I was really tempted to just immediately try and make a ring. However, I knew that starting ring. with something complicated mm. like a ring would be a horrible idea, and it would introduce a whole bunch of new. Not issues. a jewelry person, so, so instead, I, that sounds like I decided a hard, to just make a simple display. little bar. In particular, though, I really wanted to make one that looked exactly like a typical gold bar, except that it was purple. <laughs> and I went ahead and melted a bunch more metal. After that, I went and got one of my small bar molds, and this time, I was gonna blast it until it was red hot. I was really hoping that this would prevent the metal from freezing and help it fill the mold better, and when I felt that I was ready, I carefully poured it in. I was a bit concerned that I was going to miss or something, but it all turned out fine, and I was really happy to see that it easily filled the entire mold. I then let it all slowly cool down. Yeah, what he did preheating both the uh, cast and the uh, tools that he used to grip it makes a lot of sense, just in terms of not losing not losing that heat quickly. That's uh, that part I can understand. And when it was eventually around room temperature, I had to get it out of the mold, and I was a bit worried that it might be stuck. However, that clearly wasn't the case, and it just easily <laughs> fell out, and this made it pretty clear to me that there was no issue with molding it. Nice. There was, of course, still one problem, though, and that was how ugly it was. And what I had to do next was see if I could actually turn it into something nice. To do this, I decided yeah, to just sand it by hand, which wasn't exactly ideal. But I didn't want to lose any of the precious gold dust. Unsurprisingly, like though, <laughs> this turned out to be super tedious and difficult. And it ended up taking 10 hours to get Whoa. into a shape that I liked. I then polished it by moving up to finer and finer sandpapers, yeah. and when I eventually felt that it looked good, I annealed it, and this was the final result. Wow. It was pretty much exactly what I was That's hoping beautiful. for. And it was just like a normal gold bar, except it was pinkish purple. Just a purple little gold bar. And I was bar. really happy with how it turned out. One of the other fascinating things about gold, so I mentioned in part one that it could be used as a diagnostic aid for cancer, but it can actually be used to treat cancer. It's used in brachytherapy, which is close range cancer treatment that involves placing radioactive sources either inside of it or right next to the tumor. So for things like prostate cancer, for instance, where you have a fairly accessible point of entry. And you can either use just, you can either use radioactive gold, gold 198, or you can alloy it with uh, a different isotope such as iodine-125 or palladium-103 to perform these little radioactive pellets or seeds, I've heard them referred to. Then you implant them near the tumor and uh, the gold casing, because of the density of gold, um, in the case of wh whether you're using pure gold or gold with palladium, will just keep ensure it's a very localized concentrated dose because your objective is to use a radioactive source to kill cells, but you just want to harm the cancer cells. You don't want to damage the surrounding healthy tissue. And gold is very good for that. One thing is gold is well tolerated by the body. It's not a toxic element like using, say, plutonium, which is just a toxic heavy element like, like lead. It's very precise because you can have these very, again, these very small uh, targets. These small seeds can just affect a very small area, but can be quite deadly, which again, you want to kill the cancer cells. And it's also um, easily manipulated. It can, be, it can play well with um, a lot of different radioisotopes. So it can be customized to what the patient needs, depending on what type of cancer there is, what, how, how aggressive it is. You can kind of, you can dial your setting a little more precisely just by, by combining it with different radioisotopes to, to treat the cancer precisely. It's interesting because yeah, before I became a nuclear engineer, I didn't, I didn't realize gold could be used as medicine. The only thing that I thought was odd was that it didn't seem nearly as purple as my other piece. And this one kind of looked like it was a light pink. However, after a bunch That's of testing, pretty. I found that this was mostly just because it was way shinier, which made it appear a lot brighter, and I'll talk more about this later on. With all that being said, though, 
being able to make this fully proved to me that it was definitely possible to cast and clean up the purple gold. And at this point, I was feeling pretty excited. What's also fascinating is since he already mentioned he did extensive research and there's not a whole lot of stuff out there that can help you as a procedure, Nalred's given people a process to, to work with that is better than just, you know, reading and following the patent because he's had a few things to fall back on. So this is pretty cool. And, and this is on YouTube for free. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> However, my mood completely changed when I decided to take a much closer look at it and I was kind of horrified by what I saw. Oh, it's got little holes. It was apparently riddled with a bunch of small cracks, and I have no idea how I didn't see this at all up until now, and I think I was just blinded by all of the excitement. Or maybe they what slowly made things came even in. worse was that it also looked like the color wasn't very uniform, and there were a lot of spots that appeared to be completely colorless, almost like the metals didn't mix properly. Hmm, so probably wouldn't want this as a wedding ring, because, like, you tend to, uh, to ding it when <laughs> just through doing stuff with your hands. Hmm. In my opinion, though, that would be a relatively easy fix, and I just had to mix things better, and the much bigger problem was all of the cracks. This is especially because once I noticed them, I couldn't just unsee them, and I couldn't help but think that they were super ugly. Mm. What made it even more horrible was that it was throughout the entire thing, which meant that I couldn't just sand it away. And when I looked back at some other random pieces that I made, I noticed that it was there too. At first, I tried to convince myself that maybe that was just how purple gold was. And to prove this, the aluminum. I ended up buying a small pendant from Li Hua. The moment that I opened <laughs> the box though... It. I immediately realized that I was just in denial. This because the surface of it looked almost perfect, mm. and I wasn't able to see any of those gross cracks in it. It was only when I really zoomed in that I could actually see some small surface defects, and there were definitely at least a few small holes. I could also vaguely see that, like mine, the color wasn't perfectly uniform either, sure. but overall, it was clearly way better than what I made. As a quick side note, Good to know. Uh, that, that's actually one thing that I'm surprised you didn't show earlier in this video, but guess getting a picture of, you know, what the target is just so you know what the finish line looks like and if you could even improve on it one way or the other. It also seemed to be significantly more purple than my pinkish bar, but again, this turned out to be mostly just a lighting thing, and I promise that I'll talk about this more later on. Mm. But anyway, at this point, it was pretty obvious that these holes weren't meant to be there, and the very unfortunate part was that I still had no idea what I was doing wrong. All I knew was that I hated how ugly it was, and that this was unfortunately something else that I was going to have to fix, and this project really just felt like a never-ending sequence of problems. With that being said, just like before, I ended up trying a bunch of random things, and when they all inevitably failed, I desperately looked at the patent, and I tried searching online. However, unlike last time, I wasn't my, able to I'm find even a vague reference of this oh, happening no. with purple gold. <laughs> what I did find, though, were a lot of sources that mentioned a very similar problem that commonly happened with pure aluminum. I also found a really useful report that talked about this issue in detail, and they provided a photo oh, from Oak Ridge National of what Lab. it could make the aluminum look like. people that work there. All of the dark spots were small holes, just like what I was seeing with the purple gold, and apparently, this was mostly just caused by moisture in the air. This is because when aluminum is molten, it's able to react with the moisture, which then causes it to form some of those crusty oxides like we saw before, sure. as well as some hydrogen gas. Mm. I always kind of assumed that all of this hydrogen then kind of just floated away, but apparently, a lot of it actually gets dissolved into the molten aluminum. Then, as the aluminum cools, the solubility of the hydrogen slowly decreases, and right around the time that the aluminum is solidifying, it all gets kicked out as a bunch of bubbles. Hydrogen gas is actually something at extreme temperatures. I'm talking um, north of 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, well over three times hotter than the temperatures in a pressurized water reactor. That's when the hydrogen gas production occurs. 
that's with zircon the zirconium zirconium which has a way higher tolerance for temperature than aluminum is used in in the nuclear fuel cladding it can have a reaction with water that can generate a lot of hydrogen gas which is explosive in certain concentrations and that's the main hazard that can cause explosions within that's the main reason why the core cooling critical safety function for accident mitigation is to keep it well below that 2200 degrees. You enter that the uh, highest threshold for that when core exit thermocouples, which is as close as you can get to measure these sort of things, is at 1200. Because a calculation is done extrapolating outward for where the, the fuel cladding actually is versus where, where you can measure it. And basically your actions are to ensure all of your safety injection systems, your emergency core cooling systems, are functioning properly. If they are, you'll never get to that point. So it's the only time I've seen that in a simulator scenario is when they break all of your independently separated systems just to make the scenario hard. The odds of such a thing happening are greater than one in a billion shot per year. What's interesting is when you manage risk in a nuclear plant, saying something's a one in a million chance is still unacceptable risk because we're talking about fuel damage. And keep in mind, I'm talking about fuel damage, um, the uh, so-called meltdown event, not, not dosing the public. Because you can have meltdowns without um without causing a radioactive release we saw that in the uh three mile island hydrogen yeah hydrogen causing causing explosions breaking the reactor coolant system um the contain containment buildings do have systems in place such as hydrogen recombiners and those recombiners use platinum or palladium as a catalyst to get hydrogen at high temperatures to recombine with oxygen to turn it back into water. And we didn't have this at the plant I worked at, but you can also use what are essentially spark plugs. So how do you prevent a bad hydrogen explosion, a really big one? Well, you can set off a bunch of little hydrogen explosions because the big ones are the ones that could potentially cause damage to the reactor containment building, whereas it's designed to withstand a, a lot of small explosions. But yes, hydrogen rearing its ugly head again with metal casting, just like it does in nuclear power plants. <laughs> Though it does different things. What I thought was interesting, though, was that they also provided this photo, which is what it looks like if all of the hydrogen's removed before it solidifies. There's hmm. a pretty obvious difference, and all of those cavities are completely gone. And now, it's just a nice and smooth piece of aluminum. After seeing this, I felt that it was pretty clear that this was almost the exact same issue yep. that I was having, and this seemed to be confirmed when I looked back at some of my footage. More specifically, I looked back to when the bar was solidifying, and I was able to see what looked like bubbles popping on the surface. When I saw this, I felt that it was pretty clear that this was all just hydrogen gas getting kicked out as it solidified. The only thing that I thought was weird was that I was already using argon to block out all of the air and therefore the moisture, and I wasn't entirely sure where this hydrogen was coming from. I mean, it was possible That's, that it was yeah. from the short period of time that it sat there in open air before solidifying, but I really didn't feel like that was the case. Either way though, if I wanted to make something that wasn't hideous, I was going to have to somehow get all of the hydrogen out of the aluminum and there were apparently many different ways to do this. It's interesting because he mentions the argon. That's also the same reason why it's used in welding applications. So I decided to just try everything that I thought might work. And one table method salt. that I thought was really promising was to just include a bunch of table salt. However, again, most of the things that I tried totally failed. And after a week of frustration, well, used borax earlier. I felt that I was left with only one real option. Was the intent to use it as a flux material, so it just kind of forms this little molten layer that acts as just a blocker from oxidizing the actual gold aluminum? For this one, I was going to have to try and bubble some argon gas through the molten purple gold instead of just using it to protect it from air. Hmm. This was actually something that I'd been kind of avoiding because even though it sounded relatively simple, it was kind of tricky and I wasn't going to be able to just lower in my stainless steel tube. Yeah. 
This is because at 1200C, the aluminum was way too angry and it would just dissolve <laughs> too it. angry. And I saw this happen firsthand when it dissolved one of my steel spatulas. Mm. So I was going to have to swap out my tubing for one with a different material. And unfortunately, there weren't many other options. Yeah. I couldn't just use other metals because they would also probably get dissolved. To I couldn't use glass into because the it would melt. Mess. And I couldn't use graphite because as far as I can tell, small graphite tubes don't exist. <laughs> After thinking about it for a while, though, Graphite's I started also been wondering on fire if risk. something like fused quartz might work. And I remembered fused that I actually quartz. had a bunch of small tubes okay. that I'd gotten for free. Just by looking at them, they appeared to be pretty much the same as normal glass, except unlike normal glass, they were made with nearly 100% silicon dioxide. This would make them significantly more resistant to high temperatures, and there should be almost no risk of it melting or cracking, and I really didn't see why it wouldn't work. I also had a lot of faith in fused quartz after I'd used some to burn diamonds, I remember and it that survived one. being red hot yeah. under a flow of pure oxygen. So I decided to give it a chance, and I was really excited to get started, but then I realized that I actually had no gold left. This is because in all of my random attempts, I had apparently used all 99.99 grams of it, and it was now just a bunch of random trash. <laughs> this was kind of a huge pain, but I didn't really have a choice, and I just quickly redissolved it all in a bunch of acid, and I processed it in the same way as the there, original gold There we bar. go, yeah, just like the Then after the a couple for days of work, stuff. I had some nice and crispy gold powder, except when I weighed it, it was only 95 grams. Ooh. This meant that I'd somehow lost about 5 grams of gold along the way, and this made no sense to me because I'd been extremely careful, and I thought that I'd collected absolutely everything. Well, he did so much, like, cutting and sanding and smashing and all of that, it's hard to catch all of that, even if you happen to be using it on working on the same surface. Yeah, there's just, he didn't so much of it. I'm actually not surprised he didn't lose more of it. <laughs> just given what, what he's showed us in, in these steps thus far. Either way, I could now finally test out my new method. So I went back to my furnace and I poured in all 95 grams of the gold that I just purified. This is because I didn't think that it could be done on a very small scale. And if I wanted to actually be able to bubble gas through it, I felt that I was going to need as much molten metal as possible. With all of the gold melted, I then carefully lowered in the quartz tube, and with it in place, I slowly opened the argon. Then on top of this, I dumped in the aluminum, which all quickly mm -hmm. melted, and this time, I stirred it with a graphite rod. This was also what I should have been using from the beginning, because unlike my spatula, it wouldn't just dissolve, and when I eventually felt that it looked now, one thing about stirring stuff like this is, so I wouldn't know this from personal experience, but just based on how air and heat transfer work, you got to be careful with that. Because if you're a little too aggressive, you can potentially introduce air and other impurities just from, just from the turbulence of stirring. So there's, there's a trade-off between trying to achieve the, um, the homogeneity that you would get from stirring and actually introducing something to the system that you don't want. Good. I lowered in the quartz tube and I slowly increased the gas flow. My goal was to get it to bubble as much as possible without splashing too much. And the idea here was that the argon kind of a funny noise. would carry the hydrogen out of the metal. To a certain degree, this would also help mix the gold and aluminum and when I felt that it was going at a steady rate, I covered it with some insulation. Cool. I then had to leave it like this for a while to make sure that I got out as much of the hydrogen as possible. And based on what I read online, about 20 minutes seemed decent. So I basically just had to wait. Meantime, I went and got my mold, which was again, just a simple bar mold. Gold bars. This is because I had to make something that I could compare to the last one and to see if this apples process apples. had actually made a difference. But anyway, at this point, it had been about 20 minutes, so I started blasting the mold with the torch. Then, when I eventually felt that it looked nice and hot, I quickly took apart the whole degassing setup, and going as fast as I could, 
I poured it all into the mold. After that, I waited for it to cool down, and when it got to around room temperature, I popped it out of the mold, and I started cleaning it up. Almost immediately, it was already pretty clear that there was a major improvement, and even after very little sanding, it looked like most of the cracks were gone. Nice. I would only really be able to know for sure once it was all nice and shiny though, so I just kept on going, and many horribly painful hours later, <laughs> I annealed it, and this was what I eventually had. Whoa. Without even comparing it to the other bar, this one was clearly way better, and what I was extremely happy to see That's beautiful. was that it didn't seem to be riddled with a bunch of small holes. To actually know how much oh, better wow. it was though, yeah. I was gonna have to pull up a photo of the old one, and the moment that I saw it, the difference genuinely surprised me. It seems a little me. bigger too. It was actually somehow even uglier than I remembered, <laughs> and it was pretty undeniable that the degassing step had made a significant difference. I mean, if I really zoomed in, I could important. clearly see some very small holes, and it definitely wasn't perfect, but overall, I still thought that it was really nice, and I was very happy with how it turned out. One other interesting thing about hydrogen is it can actually reach a point where it's too rich to burn. In air at normal atmospheric pressure, that's a, that's a concentration of 75%. The main generator at a nuclear power plant actually uses hydrogen. It's kept above 98% concentration, so well above any threshold where it'd be explosive. Now, you don't want any hydrogen leaks, because it has several advantages, such as high thermal conductivity. It's important to have that in any sort of coolant, just in how efficiently it can transfer heat and cool off the generator. It's non-corrosive, at least to generator components. It's low windage. There's little losses caused by the friction of gas as the rotor moves through it for the generator, and that's just because hydrogen has very low density. So it'll ultimately make your generator more efficient, as well as keeping it cool. Disadvantage is you don't want a hydrogen leak, because again, hydrogen can be explosives. If you're, if you're between 4% and 75% in air, you don't want to have anything to do with hydrogen. The only thing that was still kind of off was the color, and just like the other bar, it was definitely more on the pink side. However, as I mentioned a couple times earlier, it turned out that this was all just an annoying lighting issue. <laughs> this was actually something that really messed with my head for a while, wow. and it's honestly sad how long I spent staring at little pieces of metal and trying to compare their colors. What really settled things for me, though, was getting that pendant from yeah. Li Hua, which allowed me to compare my stuff to some professionally produced purple gold. Wow. I also started using a polarizer for my camera, which would let me remove some of the reflections, and suddenly, it was very clear that they were the same color. Nice. To me, this really showed that it was all just lighting, and I think that my bar is just a lot shinier or something, which makes it generally mm, yeah, appear surface brighter. treatments. That's color aside, though, for at this point, I finally had what I felt was a decent way to make the purple gold, and after months of going in circles, this was a huge relief. However, I of course wasn't quite done yet, and the last thing that I still had to do was make my ring, which was mm. the entire reason why I started this project. The only concerning part was that I still wasn't entirely sure how to do this, and I was kind of worried that I'd end up in another horrible pit of trial and error. <laughs> to try and avoid this, though, well, I decided material. to go with the simplest method that I could think of. And the first thing that I did was buy a ring sizer from Amazon. I then tested a bunch of them to see which one fit my finger the best. And this was extremely important. This is because, as we it's saw true. before, the purple gold was completely non-malleable. And this meant that any cast that I made had to be almost perfectly pre-sized. With that being said, when I eventually found one that I thought yeah, fit, can you size? I was able to make a super basic 3D design, and now I just had to turn this into a mold. That's That would be pretty annoying for actually making rings, because I know that's one of the most important things to get it, is to get your ring sized, is, is getting the ring size just right. I mean, I know before I got married, I had no idea what what my ring size was <laughs> and I actually wear the same ring that my dad did and who is no longer with us I wear the same ring to honor him but he had way bigger fingers than me 
I had to bring it down two sizes. <laughs> so I can see that as a pretty serious drawback of using of rings, especially rings you want to pass on to uh, to not have that that ability to resize them. With normal gold, there are a few common ways to do this, like with gold lost grills and casting. With the Z. But I was worried that all of them would end up having issues with the purple gold. So instead, I decided the best idea was to just do it in a graphite mold, which I was now very familiar with, and I knew would probably work. The only tricky part was that I couldn't just buy a mold, and for it to perfectly fit my finger, it was gonna have to be custom made. In theory, I probably could have found someone online to do this for me, but instead, I used this as an excuse to buy a CNC machine and to learn how to carve out my own Jeez. graphite molds. Nice. This actually ended up oh, being a cool. lot of fun, even though it was sometimes a bit frustrating, and I can now make pretty much any graphite mold that I want. With that being said, for this project, all I had to nice. do was make this super simple one, and with it now ready, I was finally able to try and make the ring. That's fun. So again, I just quickly repurified <laughs> all of the gold that wasn't used to make my big bar, and I remelted half of it in the furnace. I did this so I'd be able to get at least two attempts, and I was just hoping that 30 grams of gold and about seven grams of aluminum would give enough volume for the degassing. I then let it sit there, and after about 15 minutes, I started blasting the mold with a torch, and I was eventually ready there to try go. and pour it. I was honestly really concerned that I would either completely miss or that the metal <laughs> wouldn't flow through yeah, that's the hard entire to get it thing. In there. Whoa! But it turned out to be totally fine. <laughs> All I had to do now was wait for it to cool down, except this part I was actually more concerned about because I knew that this was going to cause it to shrink. This was also Ugh. a huge issue because this meant that the Precise inner side of the ring sizes. would start contracting while the outer side of it would stretch. And since the purple gold had no real malleability or ductility, this would almost definitely cause it to break. To try and avoid this, I'd purposely angled the inner edges of the mold, hoping that as it contracted, it might pop itself out without cracking. At the same time, I genuinely believed that there was a narrow window of time where it was possible to manually remove it, mm, and I just yeah. kept trying to pry it out. Oh no. <laughs> However, I apparently wasn't skilled enough and it ended up just cracking itself in half. No. It just snapped. Oh. <sighs> mm. This was also really sad because the ring had actually molded super well. And now, unless I want to spend days repurifying everything again, I only had one last chance. So I just anxiously whipped together there another batch, heated the mold red hot, and carefully poured everything in. This time, though, there somehow wasn't enough metal to fill the entire mold, and at first I was sad about this, but it actually turned out to be a good thing. As it expands. This is because it prevented the ring from fully connecting, so as it contracted, it didn't just squeeze down on the sorry. middle part and snap itself, and I was actually able to get it out of the mold. It's one advantage. Huh. It's in one piece. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. What I had now wasn't exactly what I was expecting, and it kind of looked like a failed attempt, but at the same time, I felt that this different shape was kind of cool, and I decided to just go with it. There are rings that look I like that. I spent the next couple of days sanding there and grinding it. There are rings that look it, like that. And this time, I also used a Dremel, yeah, there which you go. made things a lot easier. The part that I actually had the most trouble with was just coming up with a design that I liked, and almost the entire time, I was really worried that it would turn out absolutely hideous. <laughs> Eventually, though, I was able to make something that I felt I was happy with, so I polished it up as best I could, and then annealed it, and this was the final result. Wow. It was honestly way nicer than I ever imagined cool. it would be, and I kind of found it hard to believe that I had actually done it. I finally had my ring that was made entirely out of purple gold, and it was probably one of the only ones in existence, and after months of work, That's awesome. I think it was it all fit. worth it. What was also nice was that it wasn't nearly as fragile as I thought it would be, and even though I'm not going to test it, I don't think it would break if I dropped it. 
I also <laughs> I can don't understand think that would to... be a problem to casually wear it as long as I'm careful. There you go. And I would probably just have to avoid accidentally slamming Index it into finger. things. Hmm. With all that being said, though, when I first started this project, I was honestly really concerned that it would just be Does a it fit on your failure, finger? especially because of all of the things that I had read <laughs> online. However, it turned out that purple gold wasn't nearly as bad to work with as I thought, and with just a relatively simple setup, I definitely think that it's possible to make some nice jewelry. I also think that there's still a lot of room for improvement on the method that I used, and I already That's have a so few cool, ideas though. that I want to test out. For example, something that I really want to try is just using higher purity argon, which has less moisture in it, and I want to try swapping my quartz tubes for something like alumina. I'm also kind of tempted to completely switch to a different degassing method like ultrasonic, and most importantly, That's kinda cool. I think there are definitely some better ways to cast and mold it. For now though, I think I'm kind of tired of melting, casting, <laughs> and grinding purple gold. <laughs> I can see and why. Instead, I'm gonna work on some more tasty projects, like turning air into alcohol. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, so in the end, this was probably the most tedious and frustrating project that I ever worked on, and what made it even worse was that I somehow kept on losing gold. I honestly still have no idea where it went because I was really careful with everything, and I'm kind of convinced that it just got evaporated or something with the aluminum. Or grinded Either up. way, though, I'm really happy that it's all finally done. That was so cool just to see all the different processes that went into it and again just see someone kind of figure something out something that isn't well known even by jewelry metal casting whatever subject matter experts that are out there and show it to us on youtube every step of the way that is probably the thing i love the most about now red's channel is how he just goes through all these steps including the uh, steps that didn't go so well thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time